Welcome in to the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one rated sportsbook app out there. My pick of the week today is game four of the, no, game three of the Stanley Cup final. Game four? Game four. Yeah, game four. Tampa's a 2-1 lead. That's the game I watched the other night. Nikita Kucherov to score the first goal of the game is plus 1,400. That's what I'm going with. Maybe a little bit of a long shot, but you can win some good money over there. So that's my recommendation at DraftKings Sportsbook. Head on over there. If you haven't signed up yet, you can win $100 on a $1 bet on any NFL team this week. Pick the winner for $1, win 100 bucks. Use code DNVR when you sign up to get in on all of the amazing deals. If that's not your thing, obviously you can bet on hockey as well, basketball, baseball, you name it, you can bet on it with DraftKings Sportsbook. Again, sign up with the DNVR code. Other conditions and eligibility restrictions apply. Be sure to head there and check out DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700. I am your host, Nathan Rudolph, joined by AJ Hayfley, as always, talking a little bit of draft on today's show with special guest Grant McCagg, founder of Recruits.ca. Grant, good to have you on. How are you doing? I'm doing well, fellas. Good to hear it. I'm, uh, everyone's holding, holding up well. We're less than two weeks away from the draft, so it's that time of year, even if it is a different time of year, for that to be happening. How, uh, how's this class shaping up for you, Grant? Well, it's, uh, I think it better not be any more shaping up. It's been, uh, been shaping up for 12, 14 months now. Long so. enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm out. Of, I'm, I mean, I'm out of shape with uh, how much shaping up there's been going on here. So, yeah. but uh, no, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, I, I stopped trying to alter the rankings a while back. I just I did my list, and that's that. You know, I've made a couple of little tweaks, but I mean, you you could keep uh, changing your draft list daily if you wanted to. So. At some point, you just have to put it to rest and just kind of ignore it and just wait for the draft to get here, basically. Yeah, it, I, we kind of ended up here. So how much of a consideration, if any, are you putting into some of these players are playing right now, particularly in the European leagues? Can these guys raise their stock at all, or is everyone pretty set? I think everyone's pretty set. You know, it's not like they're playing a, a championship games or anything like that, you know. I mean, Lucas Raymond, did. everybody was uh, fawning over him, scoring a couple exhibition goals and stuff like that. Well, I don't, you know, I mean, it's just because we, we, we're seeing them. I mean, if Jack Quinn could be doing the same thing or Marco Rossi, but they're not playing. So you, you can't penalize guys for not playing and, and uh, you know, raise a guy ahead of him because he scored a couple of goals early in the season or even in exhibition. I just... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, you can you can go watch the games and you can maybe confirm, it, you know, more than anything, just confirm that a guy's uh, still going to be in your top 10 or whatever. You know, I think more than I think a guy may fall down a little bit more so than a guy, you know, raising his draft stock, I think, at the start of the season. All right. So hurt yourself more than help yourself at this point. Um the draft, there's one guy set at the top, but the first conversation you have to have is Stutzla versus Byfield. Are, the general consensus seems to have Stutzla at two right now. Are, are you in the same boat? Yes, I am. I uh, I have Byfield at four, so. Uh, so you're low on Byfield then. Well, I guess. I mean, one spot in the rankings, you know. Like people, uh, they almost – Every year, if I have a guy one spot lower than the consensus, it's like, oh, you hate this guy, you know? Well, no, <laughs> you know? I mean, fourth overall is a pretty good spot. There's been some, uh, you know, some pretty exceptional hockey players. Uh, I can think of one, his name's Kale McCarr, that was yeah. drafted fourth overall. So, you know, it's no it, it's no slap in the face to, to be – to have three guys ranked ahead of you in the draft. I mean, it's just a ranking and, you know, well, none of us, uh, none of us ever get the, the first five guys, right. Not the NHL guys, not us, you know, 
the first, the top five picks in an NHL draft are never the five best players from the draft ever. So you can't get too wrapped up in it. But anyways, back to your question, I guess. Didn't really answer it, right? I, I, you I, uh, I mean, Stutzla, <laughs> Stutzla and uh, uh, Byfield, I, I just think that uh, the, the German has more offensive upside at the end of the day. So you, uh, you have to rank him ahead of, of Byfield. Uh, you, you love the 6'5 center, but people kind of fall in love with that and and you know, well, he's six five center, so he's going to be the next Thornton or the next Primo or the next Lindros or whatever. Well, he's not that good, you know. I mean, he's very good, but just because he's six five and puts up some points doesn't mean that he's automatically going to be those guys. So, uh, I think I think there's a limit to his offensive upside. I don't know that he'll ever be a point a game scorer, and because of that. You, uh, I think you have to give the nod to the German because I think that he'll be a point of game scorer. All right. How do you how do you like his fit out in uh, uh, out in Los Angeles with all those other prospects? Uh, a point per game scorer is a fit in any uh, organization. Sure. You know, he'll uh, he'll probably be their. I think he'll be their best player down the road. Like. You know, if you had, you had to pick between him, Velarde, and, and Turcotte, I'd say, you know, Stutzla is going to end up being the, the guy. And it'll be interesting to see if, uh, you know, if they try him at center. Uh, I mean, Velarde, all three of those guys it, uh, could be centermen, but they could also end up on the wing. You know, it, it, it's similar in, in New Jersey with, you know, two or three years down the road, who are going to be their top three centermen? They have like four guys, five guys that c- could play either. And uh, it, it, I mean, that's that's the beauty of, of picking a guy that can play center or does play center. He can always end up on the wing because the transition is, is usually pretty seamless. All right. Uh, we started at the top, but we do have a quick moving show today, so... I'm not going to beat around the bush anymore. Grant, who do you have for the abs at 24? What's your bet? (laughs) Oh, geez. I guess I should have looked back at my mock. eh? I don't know (laughs) if I even, I don't know if I even remember. You got it in front of you? I don't. AJ. Well, (laughs) thanks. You you give me, you give me a second. I can grab it. There you go. (laughs) Okay. I can too. You can just Uh, tell me that you had him and I'll believe you. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I can. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you know, my memory isn't what it used to be, lads. What? Uh, Jacob what Perot. Is... You have Perot going to him. Okay. I do. Yeah. I find you finally get your own tippet there, AJ. I tell you, we've been. <laughs> been I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> 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 there are some similarities I find between the two players, actually, you know, um, they're both, uh, maybe, uh, drive you a little nuts away from the puck at times. And, uh, if he, if he can figure it out, just the same with Tippett there, he can be a, he can be a 25 to 35 goal scorer in the NHL and every team would love to have one of those guys. Yeah, so what's the fear with Perot? Uh, just uh, doesn't uh, when he doesn't have the puck. Even when he does have the puck, he's not always skating hard. You know, he's uh, he he just he's a little lazy, I guess. But uh, there's the, the skill is there. I mean, he it, like it, it was funny at the uh, top prospects combine. It was like, what the heck? This guy's top five in all of the skating categories. Well, why don't you see that in the game? You know. It's like yeah. they, uh, because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't work hard enough all the time. So, uh, I mean, we've seen players in the past that, that, that do figure that out. Right. So that's the, that's the hope that, that he does. Uh, he does figure out that at the NHL level, you're not going to just be able to get by in your talent. You're going to have to, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to uh, compete hard and, uh, he figures that part out, and he could be a really good 
player. So uh, at 24 in the draft, I think you, uh, y- you know, you have to start looking at the risky guys uh, a little more seriously because they could end up, you could end up being a top 15, even a top 10 player from this draft. So at, at 24, that's hard to pass. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on a guy like Anton Lundell because I know you have him ranked quite a bit lower than most other people. Um, I, w- I would just like to delve into that a little bit. Sure. So is it is it just is it just the feet, or is there are there other question marks about his overall game that uh, have you a little bit more, let's say, cautious with uh, with your excitement about Lundell's future? Uh, I don't know that, you know, he's a, he's a terrific offensive player. I think he's, he's very good, but, uh, um, yeah, it's mostly the feet. Uh, uh, that's a pretty important one. You know, it, it's for some guys that's, uh, they think it, that it could be a fatal flaw. Like, I mean, I have, I know some NHL scouts that aren't sure that he can be a fourth line center in the NHL, let alone the second line. So, uh, you know, when you hear comments like that, it, and in, I mean, I don't, I don't get to see these European guys live too much, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I have to, I mean, you can watch all the video you want, but you, nothing beats being at the rink and seeing, seeing a guy skating. Uh, and, uh, these guys have, have done that. And a lot of them have serious questions about his, you know, uh, there's a difference between playing in Europe and then playing in the NHL. There's no league like it. And uh, you see it in the playoffs, just the high pace of the games. And uh, you can be smart, you can be big, you can have good puck skills, but if you can't keep up, uh, it's tough to be a center in the NHL. I mean, Tyson Jost is, is a good example of a kid that has so much going for him. You know, there's so you love his compete, you love his smart, you love his puck skills, but is he going to be fast enough to be a top two center in the NHL? I think, you know, I mean, you, you picked him top t- top ten in the draft to, to do that. Well, at the end of the day, that's still got to be the question mark. So I think, you know, the, just as a comparable a type of uh, in, in that instance where. Uh, uh, I don't know that he can be a top two center in the NHL. I really don't. Maybe he's a third line center. Maybe he's a third line winger. But uh, uh, that's that's the issue, and it, it's an important one. So some guys, some guys have have uh, you know have overcome it. Uh, a lot of guys don't. A pretty big variance there between uh, you know trying to get a top two center out of the guy and then. Is he, is he get even going to be at all? Yeah. Yeah. Is he going to be a fourth line player or not? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I mean, it surprised me when I, I did hear those comments because you know, I mean, last year especially, you thought, well, this guy's playing, uh, you know, underage. He's playing against twenty year olds and looking good and 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 the whole works. But this year, it really, uh, it really stuck out that. Uh, his skating hasn't been getting better and other guys have caught him and, and passed him in that regard. And you, you wonder if, you know, if he can be a top, uh, top nine player in the NHL, certainly at center, top three center, you got to be able to skate. Seems every day the NHL is, is getting to be a faster league, more skating oriented league, but we do need to take our first break right there and acknowledge WGT. DNVR's gaming sponsor. This weekend, live right now, we have a tournament going on, the DNVR WGT Major, where the first place winner at the end of the weekend will get a $200 cash prize. Second place gets 100 bucks, and the third place gets a DNVR shirt, hat, and sticker pack of their choice. So if you haven't joined yet, now is the time to do it. You can go ahead and pick it up by going to dnvrgolf.com and you excuse me search for dnvr3 to join our clubhouse get in the tournament you get one shot at it you can take as many practice rounds as you want but when you sign up for the tournament you get one goal it's closest to the hole on beth page black 
make sure to stick it close. Try to win yourself some money. It runs through Sunday night. So you got all weekend to do it. Jump on it. Get in there. Have fun with us. Again, dnvrgolf.com. Search dnvr3 to join the clubhouse and get into the tournament. Second period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast. Talking draft with Grant McCagg. Grant, continuing, I guess, this conversation towards uh, let's talk about the later rounds of the first in general you have perot going to the abs that's a super high bet on skill is that what you like to see out of later round picks more often than not or or is there a conversation about some of these kids say like a uh a paterka or a reichel that's a little bit more well-rounded in their game yeah i think you get a mixture of both you know you, you start to see some of the uh, boomer bust type of guys that, that you start to consider at that point. And also the, uh, the guys that may only have third line upside, but could help you, you know, maybe help you in playoff games, score some goals on the third line and uh, contribute to a competitive uh, contending team. So, you know, it, it's, it, uh, it's funny. I had a, a CHL coach say to me, well, I never, you know, I'd never pick third liners at any point in the draft, let alone the first round. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can you can keep picking guys that uh, small, skilled guys every round that y- you hope can play in your top six. But, you know, more often than not, they can't play in your bottom six. And you, you do need those guys. They're an important part. And, uh, yeah, you can trade for some. But, yeah, I think every year you see the, the, the teams that are at, you know, that are in the, in the semis and, and the finals have superior bottom line players. It's not just the, the stars. It, you, you, need, you need the good mix. So uh, like a player like Jake Neighbors, for instance, you know, maybe he's never a second line guy, but there's so much, uh, so many intangibles with that kid. I think he, he's going to help teams and maybe even contending teams win playoff games. So when you start to, you know, you start to weigh the the Gundlers and the, the Amarovs against the neighbors. And, and you, you know, I think maybe at that point, certainly a team usually at the end of the first round is a contending team. And maybe they look, well, let's try to fill a third line role. We've got this, we've got what we think are six uh, top six guys. Let's see if we can't get a guy that can, uh, can help make our third line uh, good enough to put us over the top. So at that point, maybe you you see teams leaning a little more towards need. So uh, anyway, that's, that's my viewpoint on it. You know, when you're, when you're at that part of the drafts, if you are a contending team, you know, like San Jose is going to pick wherever Tampa Bay ends up 30 or 31, you know, they're in kind of a weird spot, but if you are a, you know, if you are a Colorado or a St. Louis or a Dallas, Vegas, one of those teams, you know, how do you, how, how do you balance that desire for a guy like Gundler and a guy like Neighbors? Because in your mock draft, you have them going 29 and 30. And those are two super different guys with very, very different careers in front of them. Well, I think, you know, uh, a team that uh, – needs top six talent is maybe going to be a little more uh, likely to, to take a chance on a, on a boomer bust type of guy. Whereas when you've got a team like, uh, you know, that uh, Vegas or what have you, well, you, you know, maybe they have their top six guys for the future and stuff. And this guy is probably not going to play in your top six. So you go with the guy that you really think can play and can play on your third line and and be a a contributor to a contender. So I, I think, you know, like a San Jose is more likely to go with a, with a boomer bust type player because they need it. They need a guy that booms, you know, (laughs) they, they don't need the the surefire third line guy that usually uh, teams that aren't contenders have piles of bottom line players. That's, that's the problem. So I think, you know, that's, that's where you, uh, where, where the difference is and where you, you might see a, a contender 
say, well, I think this guy can play for us. And, and Neighbors is a good example. I think he can play in the NHL within a couple of years. So, you know, a contending team looks at that and says, well, geez, if he can be on, if he can be in our third line in two or three years and contributing, that's, you know, or we pick a Gundler who's, probably not going to crack our top six for at least three or four years and may not play at all. Let's go with the, let's go with the character uh, guy that we think can play within a couple of years, maybe even a year. You know, we've seen Boston do this a little bit in recent years uh, when they, they took Trent Frederick and then last year they took John Beecher. You know, those are, those are not guys with a lot of really high end upside. Those are, those are them using first round picks on, very specific role players. Uh, so I think it's, I've, I've always found this conversation interesting. And for the first time in a very long time, we actually get to apply it to the avalanche because they're actually at the, the back half of the first round for once. For the record, AJ is the resident John Beecher lover on this podcast. Yeah. I mean, I like him for what he is. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I certainly would not have picked either of those guys in the first round. You know, yeah, I th- even I was surprised I, with Beecher. That was yeah, a lot. Yeah, uh, Frederick maybe even more so. You know, um, I think, yeah, those those two surprised me a bit. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm gonna always defend the guy I've got ranked 30. That's a character guy over the guy I've got ranked 50 that goes <laughs> in the top 30. You know, yeah. So, but but yeah, I mean, I I know what. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good example, AJ, of, of a team doing that and thinking, you know, well, this guy, we can plug this guy hopefully into a, into a, a key role in uh, two or three years. And, and uh, we'll see. It's, it's interesting because at the time where Boston was, uh, I thought that those picks, you know, it, they made sense in the context of looking for depth guys, but now, you know, they're, they're staring down the barrel of serious free agency losses getting a little bit older and maybe slipping out of some of their contention window because some of their high end guys either are going to leave or they're going to age out. And it, and it's kind of, and it, you look at guys like Frederick, you look at guys like Beecher and it's like, as they slip out of that contention, you know, where they're championship contenders to now they're, they're a team that's going to make the playoffs pretty comfortably, but you don't really think that they're going to be able to win four rounds anymore. I think that that's going to come back to hurt them because drafting like that, you know, there you do it maybe once it's, it's one thing, but if you get into the habit of doing it, it's going to come back to haunt you at some point because you're not drafting high end talent. And so you're, it feels like on draft day, you're putting limits on exactly what you're going to be able to get down the road from these guys. And again, you do it once, you're trying to find you're trying to find something specific and if you get it right great that's awesome but if you keep doing it it feels like your approach to the draft is it, it feels like you it, it feels like they put limits on themselves i and, agree i agree completely yeah i mean uh, doing it once maybe but yeah two years in a row and i mean obviously obviously they had these guys ranked in their first round you know yeah they, they, I mean, they like them, like these guys more than I did. So, uh, you know, I mean, maybe Beecher has more offensive upside than, than, than most of us other than yourself think, you know, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. You, I, I, I think, you know, I, as a rule, I think teams pick, like they're not going to pick a guy that's, they have ranked 10 spots lower because they think we well, need a character guy and uh you know it, it it there's they're going to be at the top of their of the draft list you know if not yeah. the first guy well one of the first guys but how much did they how much um uh, you know emphasis did they put on getting these character guys and making their final draft list too though so it it it's it, it's complicated but I, I I can I agree completely that I don't I don't think that they should have gone with uh, two guys in a row that uh, I you know I know they said after they got Beecher oh he can be a 
he can be a second line guy and this and that, but certainly the majority of NHL scouts don't think that. So. Well, and I know they, you know, just using the, the Frederick example, they took some heat because they, they kind of came out and said, Hey, we hope that this guy's a third line guy for us someday. And I know that there were people who were like, well, then why did you take him in the first round? <laughs> and, you know, now that Colorado's kind of in this range where we're talking about, oh, do you do you take a guy that's a little safer or do you take more of a Jacob Perot type and you roll the dice with some skill and some upside? You know, safe safe as death is one of, you know, one of the big phrases that you hear in hockey all the time. And I think it certainly applies to trying to project teenagers into the league. If a guy doesn't have high-end upside when he's in juniors, I think, I think you're dreaming if you're uh, – and you might be delusional if you start trying to project some of these guys to be really high-end NHL players. Well, I have to admit, AJ, I think I, I was influenced to a certain degree by you with that choice of uh, parole there because all these years you keep, oh, we got to get a goal scorer. we got to get a goal scorer. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll admit that, uh, you know, Maybe maybe uh, I haven't been up to date on it, and and you have a different tune now. But I, you know, I, I did I did think of you when I made that when I when I slotted him in at twenty four. I have to admit that. Well, I uh, I released a a piece today on our site about guys that I think are good fits for the ABS, and I have Pro on the list. So oh, good. I don't have any objection to the pick. Uh, I like the player. I think the fit is good. And at some point, like Colorado's done a good job of getting a lot of a lot of talented guys with a lot of different skill sets, but getting and developing just a just a really high end goal scorer outside of Miko Rantanen, who's you know who does a whole lot of other things for them. Besides, too. not to shoot a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, the goals the 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 really exciting goal scorer is still something that that system lacks. Uh, outside of, I guess, like Alex Bocage and maybe Alex Newhook as well. Yeah, I, you know, I think, I think there's a good fit there if he, uh, and, uh, you know, that it, as I said in my mock draft, uh, you know, this, this kid shows up at training camp and he looks at the work ethic of, uh, you know, McKinnon, who's uh, arguably the, one of the top three players in the league. And, you know, if that doesn't rub off on you, well, if he can't be inspired by, you know, a superstar that works as hard as he does, then he, he, he isn't going to figure it out in any organization. So I think that it's a good fit in that way where there's going to be some really great mentorship from, from McKinnon and the like, uh, Landis Gog as well. There's uh, really good role models there. And I think, uh, I think it can rub off on him and he could become, well, I mean, you know, down the road playing with either New, New Hook or uh, or McKinnon, he's going to have the playmaker there too that that can really, uh, if, if he figures it out, I think this kid could be a 35 goal scorer for the Avalanche down the road. So that's a pretty nice uh, chip to pick up at 24th overall. Yeah, I, I hate to interrupt, but. Do you – what kind of beer are you drinking? I, I know you got a beer. No one can see you, but what kind of beer is it? <laughs> I am drinking a maritime beer, Alexander Keese, India Pale Ale. Excellent. Scotia. I will have to pick some up the next time, if ever, I'm in Canada again. But if you want a Colorado beer instead – Breckenridge Brewery is the beer for you. We have eight different beers from them on tap down at the DNVR bar. If you want to come on down and get some of that, or of course you can use the Breck beer locator online to find some near you. I think we even have heard some stories of some of it entering Canada. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but it's all over the United States at this point. So one of our big beer sponsors there. We really appreciate them. They've been a long-time sponsor with us. So if you haven't tried Breck Brew yet, they have a beer for everyone. Now is the time to do it. Third period of the DNVR Avalanche podcast presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. Grant, we've hit on some of the guys that you don't love that are slated to go in the first round like Lundell. So I'm, I'm curious on the other end, have you identified any guys that you think could be risers on draft day, any dark horses for the first round? Uh, not a lot of dark horses, really. I think uh, most of the guys in my first round are, 
are uh, are slated to go in the first. Um, I guess one uh, exception would be Evangelista. Perhaps he's not uh, ranked in a lot of first rounds, and um, I, he, uh, he ended up playing on the first line in London. And uh, there's just so much respect for for Dale Hunter. Like he almost does the scouting for you, you know. If this guy thinks that that the player is a first line guy as a as a in his draft year, then uh, you, you know that that he really likes his all round game, maybe more so than a lot of independent scouts do. Um, it, it's rare that that a London player that's 17, 18 years old plays on 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 the first line. So uh, that alone, I think, is uh, it's just testament to just how how good this kid is already, and he's got two more years under Dale Hunter. And he's only going to get better. Um, kid makes a lot of plays. He's always with the puck. He's uh, he's always creating offense. And I think, I mean, you saw it with a guy like Thomas. And I mean, I can go on and on. That just you know, uh, after they're drafted, they just keep getting better and become really solid NHLers. So that to me is a guy that I think will go higher than uh, you see on a lot of draft lists and is. Uh, is a pretty good prospect. Obviously, Jake Sanderson is the the obvious one for me. Um, I've got him ranked third overall, and I don't think anyone else has him that high. But uh, I really see a lot of uh, Heiskanen like qualities there to his game. He, you know, obviously he's not going to be. I mean, Miro's reached another level offensively, and perhaps Sanderson's never that good offensively, but. Uh, one-on-one -on -one defender, uh, skater, mobility, uh, transition with the puck, getting it out of his own zone. He's just such a great skater, and, and there's a lot of upside there. And I think uh, I think that's the guy that's going to go higher than a lot of people think. With a player like that on the board, we've talked about Gundler and Neighbors as well. The Avs don't have a second-round pick, and a conversation AJ and I have had – on this podcast is maybe the Avs should look into moving back. It, is that a consideration in this draft and in general? Is that something teams should look to do a bit more often? Are you more of a use your first round picks, pick high, or a bit more of a value by commodity, get as many picks as you can type? Well, that, that's a good question. I think if uh, – obviously – you look at it as, as your pick gets closer. And if uh, the players that you have in your top 20, say, are 24, and there's no one that you just say, well, geez, I, I got to have this guy, then, uh, you know, maybe you pick up the phone and you, you chat with, a, I don't know, Ottawa, say. It'd be nice to have the 28th and the 33rd pick or the 28th and the 51st pick, you know, move back a few places, get – do a swap with them if, if Ottawa really has a guy that they, you know, it depends. It, it's a two, it takes two to tango in this instance, you know. There's a team that really loves a player that they're willing to move up and, and, and give a nice, uh, you know, two or three uh, draft picks that are still in the top 60. And, uh, the, you know, and you don't really love any of the players that are on the board and you think that, you'll still be there at 28 or what have you, the guy that you'll probably like the most. And you, uh, then you, then you consider it, especially as you say, because they don't have a couple of, you know, they only have one in the top 60. So a team like Colorado, I think would be, might be more susceptible to, uh, to making a deal like that. Why uh, I'm, I'm, just kind of sticking on the on the idea of moving around it seems like it seems like every year there's a team in the top 10 that talks about moving up moving down and then we just don't ever see those teams do anything why do you why do you think that we've seen the death of the 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 top 10 pick getting traded for another pick i should say because we've seen them involved in player trades right um usually you know uh, a top 10 pick, you're getting a player that you really like, you know, it's, yeah. uh, if you're picking eight, 
you probably got a guy in your top five. You know, you're picking 10, you probably got a guy in your top seven. Well, you think that you're going to get a guy that's one of the top seven players in the draft. In the seller cap age where, you know, top 10 players are usually playing within a year, entry-level contract, uh, all that, I think, factors in as well, right? I mean, it's, it's so valuable to have a, uh, an impact player on an entry-level contract when you have a salary cap because you can, you know, you can get other pieces uh, to help uh, you hope to, to maybe win a cup while the, while that player is, is on his entry level contract. So it's, uh, it's tough to, uh, it's tough to trade away a top 10 pick. I think trade down. It's, it's, it, it just, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, you love their, the, the guy that you pick in the top 10, you really like. So you, you know, it's got to be quite an enticing package to get talked into moving down. Yeah, definitely fair enough. Uh, as we kind of winding down the show here, I did have one more question. We haven't really touched on any of the, the defensemen, particularly in that second tier uh, that could potentially be there when the abs pick or if they move back for one, something like that. Is there, is there a defenseman that stands out to you? Uh, at the end of the first, early second round, that kind of range? Well, I, you know, I think uh, O'Rourke would be somebody that's uh, on the radar for, for Colorado at 24, you know. Um, back to the Sault Ste. Marie, right? At uh, Timmins and, and, and uh, O'Rourke. Uh, real character player. I think, uh, you know, I, I pondered him quite a bit for uh, – for Colorado, actually, at 24. Um, he's a guy that just, uh, you know, he may end up being a, a fourth, a number four D-man uh, with loads of character and uh, and intang intangibles. So for me, that's the guy. That's the guy that uh, Colorado, if he's there on, on the draft board at 24 and they, you know, they want another defenseman, I think he's uh, he's a serious consideration to go to the Avalanche. Well, now I'm glad we had you on because neither AJ and I wanted anything to do with him. So, <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Why is that? Neither neither one of us have just uh, in our in our viewings of him, we've been very blah about his game. There hasn't been anything about him that's really stood out to me that says I'm a first round pick. You know, right. I don't, uh, I like, I think he's, it's a, it's an all around package that just sort of feels like vanilla ice cream to me. That yeah. same kind of conversation you were having about the forwards where the, the D man I like who will probably be gone there is William Wallander. I want to take a shot on the guy who has the high upside talent. And I'm not sure that O'Rourke has enough talent there. The intangibles are great. They get guys a long way, but yeah not sure i believe um, in the offense yeah well wallander uh yeah you can have him like uh oh boy <laughs> not a fan oh i don't you know he's big yep he's big yeah. yeah did you see him play in the second half of the season i've seen a handful of his games in in the junior okay. league I, I haven't been able to catch him in the pro league but yeah no i geez i mean uh, if there's any guy in the first round that I think, uh, you know, there seems to be a Swedish defenseman pick 25 or 20 to 31 every year that, you know, five years down the road, you're saying, where the hell is this guy? That's the guy. That's the guy this year, you know, but it's like, Oh, we've got to pick another Swedish defenseman at the end of the second of the first round, because there's got to be two great Swedish defensemen, you know, every draft. So, I mean, I can go – I'm trying to think of some of the names, but, you know, Anaheim picked one. Uh, Greg, there's been a few. Oh, Jacob Larson, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can go on and on. There's guys – Minnesota Swedish, took Philip Johansson. There's Johansen. a big Swedish defenseman picked at the end of the first round every year and five years down the road you say, where the hell is this guy? And I, that's, that's William Wallander this year. Uh, O'Rourke is a uh, very good skater – he um, he doesn't do anything poorly, you know. I I, I don't disagree with the maybe with the uh, vanilla part, 
But uh, I mean, yeah. you're, you're eating a vanilla ice cream. He's going to slap it right out of your hand. You know. <laughs> 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 Fair yeah. enough. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's character all the way. He's captain at 17 years of age. There's a reason for that, you know. The, the, the coaches know these guys better than we do, you know. You don't name a kid captain at 17 years of age unless, well, I don't know, Gabriel Landeskog would be an exception. You like that guy? He's all right. He's pretty yeah. okay. okay, yeah. All right. Well, uh, I, I don't disagree, though, with, uh, you know, he's not big. He's not going to go end to end, you know, he's not going to, um, I don't know. He's not a high skin and, 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 and yes, maybe he is only a five or a six, but, uh, uh, number five or number six defenseman is a pretty valuable piece. And if he can be a character, a real character kid for you that plays on your third pairing for a contender, that's all you're looking for from 20 to 30, I think is, uh, his pieces you want guys that can play for sure yeah every pick that's an nhl or is a win to a certain extent right so yeah for sure for sure but i i do understand uh you know he's not uh, he doesn't wow anybody i don't think you know and so uh but at the end of the day hey i didn't have him going to colorado either so there you go <laughs> worked out <laughs> Yeah. Thoreau it is. <laughs> yeah. You had, you had him going to St. Louis so he can go and try and defend Perot. <laughs> there you go. Uh, That's right. Let me tell you, in that trade, I'll take my chances with Perot. Yeah, well, hey, chocolate beats vanilla, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're about done. So, Grant, if you want to shout out anything, give people your Twitter handle where they can find your stuff. Go for it. <laughs> no, I don't want anybody – follow me i don't want anyone to buy my draft guide i'm good everything's great <laughs> if you want to follow him he's at grant mccag on twitter again recruits.ca r-a-c i can spell hang on you got r-e-c-r-u-t-e-s yep dot c-a okay canadians in your french i can't do it it's not recruits come on now. <laughs> <laughs> be sure to check it out i know aj buys his gra- draft guide every year um, i'm a little bit new to the to that scene but aj's bringing me into the fold having joined the dnvr family so yeah and uh for colorado fans if you guys if you guys pick up your uh if you pick up a draft guide from recruits you'll see an article from me in there as well there you go AJ out here, even writing in the draft guide. So pick it up. Be sure to to support Grant. He's an amazing dude. Does amazing scouting work over here. That's going to do it for us on today's show. Grant, thank you again for coming on. Much appreciated. Appreciated the draft talk from you. AJ, you got a, another podcast to do, I believe. So thank you, everyone, for listening. And you can support us by getting yourself some Strava Craft Coffee cold brewed down at the dnvr bar or head to stravacraftcoffee.com and use code dnvr20 to get 20 percent off of your purchase that's it for us this week we will be back on monday i think monday we'll be doing a a kind of all-around show and then the rest of the week will be all more draft coverage so keep it tuned in and yeah i guess we'll see you then